You'll be inspired by my conversation with Dr. Tanya Golesh Boza on how you can use public speaking to influence social change on this episode of the Speaking Your Brand podcast. More and more women are making an impact by starting businesses, running for office, and speaking up for what matters. With my background as a TV political analyst, entrepreneur, and speaker, I interview and coach purpose-driven women to shape their brands, grow their companies, and become recognized as influencers in their field. This is Speaking Your Brand, your place to learn how to persuasively communicate your message to your audience. Hi there, and welcome to the Speaking Your Brand podcast. I'm your host, Carol Cox. Today, we are diving in to how public speaking can be used to influence social change. So I know that many of you listening, you're entrepreneurs, so you use public speaking to grow your business and your brand and for lead generation, which is, of course, what we do here at Speaking Your Brand as well. But also very near and dear to our heart is ways to use public speaking to change the world. I know it sounds like a really big ask, but indeed, public speaking does that. Think of all the amazing people who have come throughout history and so many of them made their mark through public speaking, whether it was on traditional campaign tree stumps or on bigger stages. That's why I'm so excited to bring to you today Dr. Tanya Galash Boza, who is the executive director of the University of California's Washington Center. She's also a professor of sociology at the University of California at Merced. Tanya was on this podcast way back in February of 2021 after she delivered her TEDx talk the prior month. She had gone through our Thought Leader Academy and worked with us during that time to create her TEDx talk, which she delivered. I'll make sure to include a link to that in the show notes. And so when Tanya reached out to me to collaborate with her and her speakers, I was so excited. And we're going to talk today about that collaboration and what came out of it. Tanya, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, it's so great to be back. Thank you, Carol. First, tell us a little bit about the University of California's Washington Center. So you moved all the way from California to Washington, D.C., which I know is your hometown, to be the executive director there. Tell us about what the Washington Center does. Yeah, the Washington Center, what we are is um, we bring students from the University of California to Washington, D.C. They take classes here taught by University of California faculty and also taught by local professionals. And the students take classes related to government, anything related to Washington, D.C. And then they engage in internships. So they come here. It's almost like a domestic study abroad. So students come to DC because they wanna know more about how decisions are made in the nation's capital and we facilitate that experience. Oh, that is so fun. And again, I know that you grew up in Washington DC, so has it been nice to be back? Oh, it has been beautiful to be home. Yeah, this morning I went on a walk with two of my high school friends. Oh, that is so great. And well, in your TEDx talk and the research that you've been doing is around gentrification in Washington, D.C. Can you give us a quick overview of that, of of your research and your TEDx talk? So my book is about how Washington, D.C. is a city that became gentrifiable right? Because gentrification doesn't happen in wealthy neighborhoods. Gentrification only happens in neighborhoods that have been subjected to disinvestment, which basically means that the city stopped investing in public schools and public services, um, particularly in Black communities. So my book looks at how and why that happens and how the city became a city that is gentrifiable. And that book is coming out in September. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. All right, that's great. And so, Tanya, let's go into now the event that just happened about a month ago as of the time that this episode will be released. So the event you called a Change the World Through Research, which, of course, again, is something that I love to hear as someone who went, you know, had a brief stint in academia as a PhD student. You know, I, I love research. I love ideas. And I love the faculty members that you brought to us so that we could learn more about their research and help them change the world through it. Why did you decide to put this event on and what was the goal of it? And how did you decide what the what the elements would be? So when I think about um, the Washington Center, right, we bring students to D.C. to engage in internships. And we do that so that students can get a better idea of how decisions are made. And the goal there is so the students feel empowered to become decision makers themselves in the future. Um, But the University of California also has a stellar, stellar faculty. We have thousands upon thousands of amazing researchers who also I would like to see more heard in Washington, D.C. So I'm just a big fan of 
policy-based or evidence-based policy. Right? So I want um, more, um, more of the policies that we pass to actually be grounded in research. So one of my goals for this center is that we become the place where University of California faculty come to present their ideas to legislators, policymakers, thought leaders in D.C., so that's the overarching goal. When I thought about how to do that, um, I thought about a, an event, a speaking event that where we could bring people in and have these dialogues and have these conversations. But I also know that although faculty have fantastic ideas and often have extremely um, relevant ideas for policy, they're not always capable of delivering those ideas in a way that's compelling. And actually, let me just backtrack a little bit. Um, just talk about how I found uh, you and your work in the first place. So maybe four years ago, I wanted to become a better public speaker. And there's lots of people out there that do public speaking trainings, but a lot of them were geared more towards small business people or kind of this felt a little more superficial, like about how you talk or don't say um or ah, those kinds of things. And I was looking for someone who could really dig down into storytelling techniques, into narrative into sort of making a story, making an argument that's compelling. Um, so when I started, when I found, that's how I, I was looking on podcasts, literally just searching, <laughs> speaking, and I came across your work and I was like, oh, wow, um, you know, Carol is a feminist. She's very smart. Uh, and I think I even caught that you spent some time in academia and I was like, oh, I should try working with her. And And I honestly had a lot of trouble finding someone to work with who understood academia. Uh, because I do think academics bring a lot of value to the table, um, but we also need a lot of help getting our ideas out there. Okay, so I had that experience myself of working with you and figuring out a way to share my policy ideas, share my research in a compelling way. And, and I know this is not common at all. Like very few faculty that I know, and I know a lot of faculty, very few have done any sort of speaking training, uh, which is remarkable because we give lectures you know, every day. We go to conferences two, three times a year. Despite doing that, we don't put a lot of thought into how to do it better. And I, and I just think it's, a, I mean, public speaking is a skill and it's a skill that can be taught. It's a skill that can be learned. So the one side of it is I want people to come here and present their research. The other side of it is I want them to do it in a way that's compelling and enjoyable so that people really take in the message. Uh, so that's how I came up with this idea of bringing a few UC faculty to DC to share their research and then to have you train them, you and your team of coaches train them so that they would be compelling. And I just say it worked because people were emailing me afterwards. How did you find such amazing speakers? <laughs> well, okay. They had amazing research and amazing ideas and amazing stories. And I really see our role as giving them the framework and the coaching to put it together in 10 minutes. So I want to talk about that, Tanya, because as you mentioned, most faculty members, they're used to lecturing in front of classrooms. They go to academic conferences and there's a, a certain style and expectation there it's a, you know, it's a lecture or reading of a paper, or maybe there's some discussion of it. So very different than the style and the format that you wanted to do because you decided to do 10 minute TED style talk. So those of you listening, I'm sure you've seen TED talks, TEDx talks online. Most of them are about 10 minutes to max 18 minutes long. So very short, very concise, and you have to be able to share your message in a way that really lands with the audience and you've a lot of times people feel like, well, 10 minutes isn't enough time. But if you, if you listen to someone for 10 minutes, you realize it actually feels longer than you realize. I'll tell you, why did you decide that you wanted to do the 10 minute TED style talks? I mean, first of all, I found that I find the 10 minute TED style talk just to be a compelling way to get across one clear message. So if we want, we weren't thinking like, oh, this person is going to present their research on how to recycle carbon and concrete. And then the, you know, the legislator is going to go back the next day and implement the policy. No, it's more about getting people inspired, getting people thinking about these ideas. So we wanted to do, we wanted people to do research that's related to policy, but we also wanted what public speaking really is, which is the beginning of a conversation, like sparking a dialogue. So the idea was not for someone to come in and present, you know, a 10 point policy proposal, <laughs> which is only going to be interesting to, to the people that are going to go back the next day and actually implement that policy. But instead, we wanted to introduce a wider range of speakers and really draw on the storytelling so that it's engaging, so that it's interesting. My nightmare as an event organizer is that everyone's falling asleep right? <laughs> like, or everyone starts talking in the back because it's boring. Right. I wanted to create an engaging event. So I think the TEDx style is one way to create a really engaging event. 
Yes, because it keeps the agenda moving along, too. And also, as the audience, you know, well, this person's only going to be up there for max 10 minutes, so I can sit through that. (laughs) All right. And I know they did an incredible job from what I heard from you and from the speakers themselves. So, And I I know that from working with them, so we did some individual one-on-one coaching with each, each of them, as well as some group Zoom workshops to help them prepare for their talks. And I know that from the ones that I coached one-on-one, what they would say to me is, well, I have so much that I want to share. And I really want to make sure that they understand, you know, because X, Y, and Z, because as the academic, as a researcher, they know so much and they have so much passion for their research area and for the change that they do want to say. And so my advice to them was like you just said, is that you're, there's no way you can share your 15, 20 years of expertise with someone in 10 minutes, much less 30 minutes. But what you can do is perhaps get them to think differently or to change a mental model or to see that there may, perhaps is a solution that they haven't encountered before regarding your topic area. Exactly. Yes, 100% agree. So Tanya, let me ask you, how did you go about selecting the speakers who ended up on your stage? So we this program was funded by the University of California Office of the President, and the funding guidelines were along the lines of, we need to do something that promotes the mission of the University of California. So I wanted it to be connected to what we do at the UC in order to secure the funding, but also in order to deliver on our funding objectives. But, but, but those objectives also align with what I think is important, which is I wanted the research. So the call for proposals was that the research had to be um, related to policy. So there needed to be some concrete suggestion. And, but the research also should be aligned with some element of social justice, um, because that's one of the fundamental values of the University of California. And then we gave priority to speakers who were um, a little earlier in their career in order to develop um, them as, as faculty members. Well, that's really nice. I have a list here of some of, of the topics that they shared. So just to give everyone here an idea. So we have everything from uh, one that was called Open Our Borders, America's New Conversation About Immigration. We had one about African kingdoms as resourceful corporations, the story of South Africa's Bafo King. We had uh, one that was about the healing power of community, my unexpected journey as BTS Army. So BTS is the Korean pop group sensation. We had another one on affording New York City. I mean, just like you said, a, a wide ranging group of topics, but re- related to, like you said, policy ideas, but also social justice. Exactly. And I think it was great to have them all together because um, my research is more in the area of the prison abolition or the immigration. So those are the talks that I would have gravitated to if they were like breakout sessions. But I learned so much from the talk about the Bafokin kingdom, which was just about how there's this kingdom in South Africa that has a lot of diamonds and that has uh, and how they share um, all the resources with the community instead of just hoarding them. And the talk about concrete, which is not the one I would have, wouldn't have been top of my list. I was like, that was so powerful. Just thinking about how we can replicate the carbon cycle by putting carbon into concrete. I was like, this is such a good idea. Yes. <laughs> right. And that is really, that is the power of the 10 minutes of a TED style talk is you can take something like that and just give someone, it's like you almost like you have to do a deep dive in the sense of like that South African kingdom who was sharing the resources or about the concrete and like relating it to what nature does naturally, right? And how we can replicate that in our human-made systems. Okay, so Tanya, so you selected the the faculty members who were going to participate and you reached out to me to, to have us work with them to develop their talks. Why did you decide to have someone help them with their with their talk. I mean, we, we talked about this a little bit earlier because you wanted to make sure that they were compelling to the audience. And then what were you hoping that we would help them to do? Well, I, I was sure that what you would help them with is first get a clear idea of what their message is, um, connect that message to something about them. Like, why are you the person um, to giving that, to give this message? And then it kind of personalizes it. And then also to use rhetorical devices, speaking techniques that make it compelling to help them with their presence on stage, with the with their performance, and also to give them the confidence that they can do it. And, and you all did a fantastic job. I mean, the speakers were to a person amazing. And by the time this, epi- this episode airs, I'll have a link ready for you to share. Um, so everyone can also see just how um, great the speakers were. 
Oh, that's exciting. And so we had myself, of course, one of the coaches, as well as Diane Diaz, our lead speaking coach, and Joy Spencer, who works with our clients on storytelling and speaking. And Joy lives in the Washington, D.C. area. So she was able to, to be there at the event in person, which I was so jealous of when she sent me pictures. But I was so glad that she was able to see them in action. Yeah, it was amazing to meet Joy. I also work with Joy when I participate in the Thought Leader Academy. So it was so great to meet her in person. I know these it's been great to have this uh, opportunity to connect online, but the in-person connection is so meaningful. It is. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to, get, to be doing more in-person events myself. So when you mentioned about con- making sure that they brought in a personal story or a personal aspect of why the research was important to them, I know that we stressed that a lot to them in the very beginning of the first workshop that we did for them about making sure that they let the audience know why this mattered to them in the first place, because in the by extension, then the audience will understand why they could potentially care about it. And you mentioned about one about concrete. And I worked with her, Dr. Savvy Miller, which she is fantastic. She is so brilliant as an engineer and what she does. And which, the way that she ended up starting off her talk was sharing a story about growing up on a farm and realizing at some point at a young age, you know, eight, 10 years old, that if the farm was getting sprayed with pesticides all the time, as most, most farms were, especially back then, and realizing that the horses that were on her property were being exposed to all their pesticides while her mother shooed her and her siblings inside the house when the pesticides were being sprayed by the low flying air Airplane. So she ended up convincing her mom to turn the farm organic instead so they didn't have to use those chemicals. And then she related to that, well, you know, if nature has already figured these things out, nature has figured out how to balance the ecosystem to make it healthy, how else can we use that in our environment, like with concrete, so that we're using nature instead of working against it? Yeah. When I think back on the talks, the easiest thing to remember is the personal story because that's what we connect to, right? And that's where the emotion lies and, and our memories are associated with emotion. So I remember first, oh, the poor little horses. And then I remember the carbon cycle, right? So it's kind of, it all connects back um, through, like, it's so interesting to think about story and then how the brain works, how we experience things and what we remember. And then and, and that helps us think more about how public speaking can work. Yeah, exactly. And when I think about the other faculty member that I coached one on one, which is Grace Delgado, and she talked about the border, the US Mexico border, and how obviously it's been, you know, both open and closed throughout, you know, the past couple hundred years. And she talked, you know, she, of course she's a historian, so she's very much into the in the history, but then she shared a very personal anecdote about how her mother and her mother's siblings had crossed the border, you know, way back, I think it was the 1940s. And the, their experience growing up, and then an uncle who was very much on the other side of how, how they thought about immigration. And again, is I remember those personal stories, and it helps me to remember her overall point of the talk. And if without those personal stories, probably most of them would have ended up as a blur. Exactly. I know it's hard. It's hard for, um, I think it's hard for anyone. It's particularly hard for academics to share those personal stories because they're seen as not serious, but it's so clear that they help make the point. It's just, the other thing about sharing personal stories is it, it makes you vulnerable. Right now, people know that Savvy cares a lot about horses. And now people know that Grace's uncle is anti-immigrant. So you people know these things about you and it's it's uncomfortable because now maybe um, someone would just come up to her and say, oh, you're such a horse lover. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But then you have people who are like, wow, you love horses. So do I. Let's go have some coffee and get to know each other. Exactly. It creates connection. I think we're scared of it, but it's kind of ridiculous because it creates it definitely creates connection. When people know a little bit more about you, then they're like um, they can connect. I know like you and Carol were about the same age. You grew up during the same time period. So then I know we connect on those things. So it, make, it makes me feel connected to you knowing that we grew up both in urban areas during the same time period. And that's in the United States, a very particular experience. Yes, for sure. Tanya, so thinking about as the event organizer, leading up to the event and then the, the, the day of the event, what are some things that you did to help you as the organizer for anyone listening who is organizing events? And then any lessons that you took away from it that you would do differently or change up for the next time that you do an event? I mean, the first thing I'll say is event organizing is so much work. So the first thing you need is help. Like, don't try and put on an event by yourself. Like, it's, it, w- it, it would be impractical for one person to do this themselves. Um, so it's really important to rely on people, on other people, have people around you that can support. I had a ton of support from multiple staff, like leading up to the event, getting, you know, getting everyone's travel together, getting everyone's lodging, um, just getting the room, the IT all those things. I think one of the things that I that I thought of 
towards the end that I'm really glad I did is we did a full run through the day of. And I know that sounded like a lot, but people were happy that we did it and we identified some glitches. Um, it was good for us, like for our team in terms of the IT and the recording and, and the internet, you know, just getting everything set, sort of deciding what we're going to put on the Zoom screen versus um, what we're going to have in the room. And then it was great for the speakers because they were able, we did it at 11 a.m. And then the event was later that that afternoon at, at 5.30. So they then were able to identify any glitches in their talk, anything that they wanted to do a little bit differently. So I think the rehearsal was super important. We also had a reception at the beginning and a reception at the end. We didn't do Q&A, which I know TEDx talks don't, don't typically do Q&A. But instead, what we did is we, we kind of set up times where people could engage directly with the speakers. And I think that also worked well. Mm, I agree. A full dress rehearsal is so helpful. I know TEDx events that I've been involved in in the past, they have definitely done, obviously we've done just informal rehearsals leading up to the event, but I know that either the day before the event or the morning of the event, they will do pretty much a, a, a full run through of, of each speaker's talk. Yeah. Yeah. So for those of you listening who are participating in an event as a speaker, whether it's a, a TEDx event or even just a regular conference event, if there's any way that, of course, that they offer any type of run throughs, either, you know, especially if it's virtual tech, if they do like, you know, tech run throughs or if it's in person, any type of run throughs, definitely participate in those as much as you can. And if they're not offering them, see if you can, if you can suggest it and they'd be willing to do that. Now, if you're going to a conference where they have multi track breakout sessions, like I'm going, I'm speaking at, a marketing AI conference at the end of July, they're not going to have a full run through for every breakout session speaker. So not those types of speaking engagement. But when you're doing something like what Tanya described, you definitely want to do a full run through of that. All right, Tanya, as we think about what is next, you know, using public speaking to influence social change, I know that you've encouraged these faculty members to apply for TEDx chapters, TEDx events that they can deliver their talk to, which is great so that they get an even wider audience than they had at your event. What's next for you and for the Washington Center? Good question. First of all, um, we are down a little bit staff, so no more events until I hire <laughs> an event planner. So look out for that advertisement soon. We've done two events. I took over in January 1st. So I've, I did two events already, which is pretty fast. Um, and they were very successful. The first one was a conference on abolitions. We brought people from around the world to talk about different ways of conceptualizing abolition, abolition of schools, abolition of prisons, abolition of borders. And it was a really great space. Um, and then we did this um, Change the World, the research conference, I mean, symposium really. So I think for, for what's next for us is really strategizing about um, the best ways to engage our constituencies and sort of and thinking about just a, 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 a reasonable rhythm for um, the center, but it, it, I love thinking about public speaking. I love public speaking. So I'm excited to think about creative ways um, to bring academics together and doing stuff that's outside the norm. Academic conferences have their place, but I think there's so much room to think outside the box for academics. And I'm excited to be in a role where I really have the latitude to think creatively about how to bring people together. I am so glad that you're doing that, Tanya. And I know everyone who's sitting in the audience is at those academic conferences are grateful for you <laughs> for bringing about uh, these changes. Tanya, thank you so much for the incredible work that you do. Thank you for supporting Speaking Your Brand and thank you for coming back on the podcast. Thank you, Carol. It's been um, a great journey getting to know you and the team over the past few years. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. And for those of you listening, if you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to share it with a friend or a colleague, including professors and academics and researchers that you know so that you can inspire them to use public speaking for social change. Until next time, thanks for listening.